Hi, welcome to Exploring the Illusion of Free Will. My name is George Ortega, and today we're going to be talking about the Ortega two-step refutation of free will. This is something I came up with, not of my free will, but I think it's very cool because it's like such a fast way to kind of just refute any and every free will arg argument that exists. Okay, and w since it's a refutation, ordinarily I go over like the importance of the show and then give um, a few reasons why free will is impossible. But in this case, I, I think I'll just I'll go through the importance and then go right into this because it really is, you know, a very, very concise and, you know, just accurate way of, of just refuting any free will argument. Okay. The reason this show, I'm doing this show, is because, um, you know, we, we have this myth of free will. And just to give an example of how, like, destructive, how harmful this myth of free will is, is like, you have to understand, like, we have various religions. And religions tend to be good, you know, they, you know, form communities, they give us morals, and, but sometimes they get things wrong. And, like, with... With this idea, this notion of free will, you can't have, you can't condemn anyone, like you can't scare anyone about going to hell or something if, if nobody has a free will, because that it just wouldn't be um, right, wouldn't be fair, wouldn't make sense. So in other words, what I'm saying is like for religious institutions that scare people, scare the hell out of people <laughs> with, with um, threats of hell, if they don't believe, whatever, um, you know, it, it requires that, that, um, that free will myth, you know. And the unfortunate thing about this is a lot, a lot of times, you know, you, you've got kids, what, five years old, five to ten, whatever, they're, they're, they're um, maybe, maybe um, younger sometimes, their cognitive facilities aren't just, you know, aren't really mature. To, to kind of like understand the nature of reality, but they're, they're, you know, they're inculcated with this belief that, that they have a free will, and because they have a free will, if they do certain things, they're destined for eternal damnation, and that's, that's just like very, very wrong to do to a kid. I mean, it's just like, ah. Uh. All right. Um, all right, so let's, let's get right into this. This is cool because this just takes two steps. And again, you can apply this. A lot of like philosophers will come up with um, a lot of convoluted, you know, pages long um, attempts to, um, <laughs> to, to restore free will, to revive free will, to, to, to prove a rule. But they, it gets confusing because like, at the, at the end of all their pages, whatever they say, and they say a lot of like really, you know, they, they sometimes say, well, we're special. We're not like the rest of the universe. We can like, you know, circumvent, we can overcome the laws of nature. No, we can't. But, all right, but um, a lot of, um, a lot of the, the free will assertions are long-winded, convoluted, you know, um, almost maybe obfuscating purposely, you know, to just like muddy the water on it, you know. And again, I, you know, I don't blame them. They, you know, they're, they're, they, they, I would hope, I would, I would, um, I mean, I wouldn't blame them if they didn't anyhow, but I would hope that they, you know, sincerely misunderstand, I guess, their, um, their position, that it's not something they're making up just because they, they, they want to believe in free will. But notwithstanding, that's, that's why this, this show is important because it addresses them all. Okay, so let's get to it. All right, two steps. The first step, you ask the person who is asserting that they or we have a free will to give an example of a decision, any kind of decision that they believe is free, freely willed. Okay, simple, you know. You don't, you don't ask them, why do you think you have a free will? You ask them, all right, fine, give me, give me an, an example, you know, give me an example of a freely, of what you consider a freely will decision is. All right, so they do that. And it wouldn't matter what that example was, you know, whether it was like, um, 
you know, choice of what to eat or what to do, where to go to school, what, you know, what to do for work. It just doesn't matter, okay? So, now here's the second, <coughs> the second part, <coughs> that um, second step that, that really just puts th to rest the whole debate. Not, it doesn't just put it to rest. <coughs> it, um, it focuses it on, um, on the central issue of the matter. So the, the second step is that you ask that person if that decision has a cause. Very simple question. Okay, so two, um, two questions. You ask the person to give you an example of a decision they believe is freely willed, and then you ask them if that decision has a cause. Now, <clears throat> at that point, if they say yes, Yes, that decision had a cause. I mean, it, this could be a th three-step refutation, but I don't think it's necessary because, like, what happens is, like, we all have the premise that everything has to have a cause, that nothing happens at random. So, um, so basically, if they say, if they say yes, there there is a cause to. Um, to whatever decision, they might say the cause is me, I'm the cause. But then you ask, fine, well, what's the cause of you? Or what's the cause of whatever you say is, um, is leading to that you know, decision you, you claim to be freely willed? And so, yeah, I mean, you know, you can see if you've, if, if you've seen my shows, you understand that causality, the fact that everything has a cause, the fact that everything happens because of cause and effect is the answer to why free will is impossible. I mean, you could see it from other perspectives like the unconscious, but I think the most general is causality. So, fine, if they say it has a cause, then they've lost the argument. The causal regression, cause and effect chain that goes back to before, you know, the planet was created, before, um, <laughs> before we were born, certainly. Events there in a cause and a way um, fashion are what, um, or the state of the universe, you know, at that time, you know, is what's creating everything, including every decision we make in, in the present. Um, so that's easy. Okay. Then, then the person might say, well, no, you know, because the, the only other answer to, to like the decision, you know, does it have a cause? It either has it or it hasn't. It can't, you can't have a decision both having a cause and not having a cause, okay? That's just like, you know, doesn't, you know, it, it's one or the other. So, like, so let's say, no, it doesn't have a cause. All right, the first thing you could say, well, wait a minute, if it doesn't have a cause, then certainly your free will could not have caused it. But, um, but the, the easier answer, and that, again, what, what puts it to rest is, well, you say to yourself, well, wait a minute, um, there is no such thing as randomness. You know, randomness is a term that sometimes, you know, arrogant scientists um, use when they are um, investigating phenomenon about which they don't understand everything. So they sometimes they say to themselves, oh, well, you know, like, there's something here happening here in this experiment, and we can't see what's going on there, so it's got to be random. And, and sometimes when they say that, unfortunately what they mean is that that event is uncaused and again the, the 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 key thing here is that there is no such thing as something that's uncaused okay that's that's the reality everything has a cause so with the, with with two steps you can apply this to any argument any and all free will arguments you've refuted it okay um and yeah, like, this, this addresses, like, for example, there's one relatively popular attempt to um, defend free will that's, that's known as alternative possibilities, that, like, you know, we, we could have done otherwise. People, you know, the, the philosophers who believe in this, they'll, they'll say to a person, well, you know, you made a decision, right? But could you have done otherwise? And... And, you know, naturally, the answer to that is, well, what do you mean by could I have done uh, otherwise? Because, like, 
from one perspective, sure, I could have done otherwise if the universe compelled me to do otherwise, if the universe was made in a different way. If, if it was the same universe, then absolutely I could not have done otherwise because, um, no, no, that's, I'm getting into kind of like the, the answer to it, but like, kind of like intuitively, it's like they're saying, well, if you could have done otherwise, then you've got a choice. That, that's, it's your choice. You could have done otherwise. You know, but that's, that's just a very kind of like naive surface um, understanding of the situation. Because the, 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 um, the salient point, the salient um, consideration is that it doesn't matter if we could have done otherwise because, yeah, like I was saying before, I kind of gave away. If we would have done otherwise, there would be a causal history to that decision. So you can't escape it. Um, and another a kind of like, um, kind of like, I, I guess it's common among philosophers. That they like to say, well, you know, of course I have a free will. I feel, you know, I feel like like I have a free will. But again, you know, this 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 isn't um, this. This matter of human will isn't like, um, it's not a subjective kind of um, exploration in a sense. There's an objective truth to it. You know, in other words, like, we don't say, well, I feel that the earth is flat, so it must be flat. I feel that the earth is motionless, so we can't be moving. You know, now feelings, you know, fine, we have feelings. Feelings do not reflect the facts of, of situations. Okay. Um, now, the cool thing about this two-step refutation, the Ortega two-step refutation of free will, is that it addresses, well, I, I said it, it addresses like any argument, any, any free, will, free will argument, but it also addresses both causality and randomness. Remember, reality can either be causal in, in terms of things having causes or random and, and it can't really be random because, again, you know, randomness doesn't make sense as a concept. Nothing is uncaused. So, but, but it, it, this, this, this proof um, of why free will is impossible addresses both the fact of causality and any kind of assertion of randomness. That's, that's probably the better, better way to say it. Okay. And, and the cool thing about it, yeah. Again, when, you know, these philosophers, they're, they're very wordy, they're very verbose, they're very, um, they get sidetracked, they get sidetracked, they go into, I mean, these, some of these guys will write, you know, complete chapters, complete books, you know, presenting these kinds of explanations, and like, for example, let's take the, the alternative possibility. No, there's another one, there's another one called um, the... Um, the one about like I, I think it's somebody's donkey or somebody's ass, or whatever. That were like you have a, a donkey and there's like food equidistant from the the donkey and um, the donkey doesn't know you know which which food to walk toward. Okay, and somehow <laughs> somehow um, some philosophers you know will write at length at length about how like when you have a situation where like either alternative is like, you know, just as well. In other words, like, there's just in the, as much food for the, for the donkey on if it goes left as there is if it goes right. So there's really no choice. Like, if, if, I, give you, if I give you a choice of like a quarter in one hand or a quarter in the other, there's no choice, all right? Again, the, these philosophers will say, will, will take pages, chapters, explaining how, you know, trying to explain how thou would prohibit free will. Okay. I mean, how that makes free will, um, how that gives a free will. Now, all right, the problem with philosophy over the last decades is even the, philosopher, the philosophers who understand that free will is impossible, they get sucked into this kind of like, this, this nonsensical exploration. And the reason I say it's nonsensical is like, apply this refutation to it, okay? Whether a person or the donkey chooses the food on the left or the right, whether you choose the quarter in my right hand or my left, either choice is going to have a causal history. You know, once you made the choice, then you, find, you ask, fine, um, is there a cause to that choice? And naturally there is. So naturally, regardless of which, which you choose, it's the causal history. 
It's the fact that there's a causal regression, a, cause, a chain of cause and effect going back to before we were born that makes either you know, decision completely um, compelled and unfree. Okay. Um, yeah, philosophy definitely needs this refutation because, yeah, um, it's, it's, it focuses on the very, very essence of the matter. Okay. <laughs> and, um, and that's the thing. That, that, that's very important. That, that's something that's really, really important in this debate. You know, you've got, even, even like with people like, I mean, sometimes you may want to explain why free will is impossible by, by showing the, um, that our brains, that our brain states, our neurology, our physiology is causal. Okay, um, so you know, so some some books will just go through all the anatomy of the brain. You know how you've got like you know different centers for different functions, and how there's evolutionary chains, and and all. You know, you can go through that kind of explanation that's very kind of like brain oriented, and that can like it's interesting, but it's not you know. Um, when philosophers do that too much, then then what happens is that the reader will get yes yeah, some idea. I mean, the good thing about that kind of research is it just it just shows very empirically, you know, the causal mechanisms in our brain. But what I'm trying to say is that um, that basically the neurological, physiological explanations of why we don't have a free will um, are still at a somewhat complex level. You know, because because you don't need that level of complexity to to explain this this matter, and to the extent that you introduce it too much, it might tend to to confuse. So um, so basically, um, all right. I I think um, I think we've covered this enough. Um, Two steps, two simple steps. Um, you ask the person who's claiming that we have a free will, that, that free will is something we have. You know, fine, give me an example of a decision you consider to be freely willed, and is it caused? I mean, it's as simple as that. Um, and yeah, and some people will say, no, no, that's simplistic. That's not simple. No, it's simple. Because the reason it's simple is because, like, i got to get into this. Um, causality is what governs the universe. That's all there is. Um, yeah, all right. So, like, this two-step refutation really requires that, that a person has a, a proper understanding of the process of causality. So let's go into that now a little. Um, causality is like, think of, think of the universe. Consider the entire universe. When I say the universe, I mean everything that exists, whether we know of it or not, okay? So like our Hubble telescopes can see like, you know, 13.7 billion years of, 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 of time that our universe has been around, and it can see like to, to some furthest stars and galaxies. But, you know, um, it's, it's logical to conclude that, um, at least with, with, the, um, with the space, that, that, you know, the Hubble telescope can't see, perhaps, what's beyond there. You know, obviously can't. There are stronger telescopes that would reveal more stars, more galaxies. So the idea is, like, so you've got this whole universe, regardless how you, um, and consider it, like, consider it um, 10 minutes ago, Okay. The universe 10 minutes ago um, is the only thing that could have um, given rise to the universe 10 minutes and <laughs> a little less than 10 minutes ago. <laughs> one, moment, um, one moment less than 10 minutes ago. And then that state would give rise to the universe two moments less than, than 10 minutes. So what, what I'm trying to say is that like, you know, our reality evolves moment to moment, you know, encompassing the entire universe. 
and so like to claim that one would have a free will we would have to claim that somehow somehow as a physical human being whatever we can we can separate ourselves from from all the other particles that are interacting because you have to um you know when, when i say the universe it's like every single particle that exists and like so that each particle at one moment in time is going to be in a different place than at the next moment in time because particles are, are, are in motion um so so when you understand that when you understand that um that it's the universe that it's evolving moment to moment and that nothing escapes that causality then you understand how this ortega two step refutation of free will makes complete sense i mean it's it's like it's very cool <laughs> okay um we've got about a little less than 7 minutes um and i guess yeah this is a this is show number 56 and um the shows are getting harder for me cuz like you know i've explained this for 6 actually i i taped um this is actually so show, show 64 cuz i taped eight other episodes with with a co-host and um a couple of guests but um but yeah i think for me like you know it's like it's hard because like yeah, actually it's hard because like you know i'm kind of like saying the same thing a lot but it's necessary it's like you know something like this when when you hear things like um when you learn things a lot of times it's it's uh you need to no no the better example when you're um let's say you want to pitch a baseball okay um to pitch it the way you want to you want to like you have to go over through the motions um a lot of times until it becomes automatic until you're just doing it you know who knows how and that that'll give you an example of of why we have free will but um but basically so what what happens is all right you're you're throwing a ball and that that requires repetitive experience with with this understanding of the nature of human will it requires repetitive hearing of this it requires repetitive considering of this cuz like um you might you might perfect example let's say you're watching this show right after you came from a sermon in a church or a synagogue and that sermon was saying well you know there is this like you know our beliefs are very important and if you don't believe them well you risk going to hell eternally okay that's you know and so you watch the show right after that and so like you're hearing what i'm saying and you're saying wait a minute you know it kind of makes sense but you know i just watched a show about like you know if i don't believe the right things i may go to hell eternally so i think maybe i don't really understand this kind of stuff all right so then you watch the show another person watches this show and they came from or you, you you know instead of going to the church whatever you you went to a scientific lecture scientific lecture of the nature of the universe um time space matter energy you know um basic physics and and you understand and you understand that um you understand causality so then you, you watch the show and all of a sudden what i'm saying makes a lot more sense so now, now i just took two extremes but basically what i'm trying to say is like if you, if you wa- if you've watched various of these episodes cuz again this is number 56 um you may not get it every time but but each time you hear it you get it better you you understand it more clearly more strongly and so like for me for me i mean like part of me says you know you've explained it or enough already um but it's not just about understanding it because like what happens is when i have to explain it over and over it's not just the audience that's that's getting better at understanding it's all, it's also me and like this this matter of human will this this understanding that human will is not free but is causal is not just a moot scientific academic point it it just has so much relevance to our lives so that like 
it's not just about understanding that free will is an illusion. It's about integrating that understanding so that like when somebody does something wrong, you don't blame them. You don't blame them. When you do something wrong, because like who doesn't do a lot wrong in our lives? My God, I mean, there may be minor things, whatever, you know, not, you know, somebody, we walk by someone and not acknowledge them. I mean, whatever, you know, um, there's a lot we do wrong. So like what happens is when, when, when we understand that free will is impossible, all of a sudden, we've created a blame-free world and a guilt-free world. You know, we're not going to blame others for what they do. We're, we may blame the universe, and we're not going to blame ourselves, so we're not going to feel guilt. All right, now, naturally, I'm not saying that um, anything goes, because, you know, that would be absurd. That would be insane. That would be kind of like, yeah. Um, in other words, you can't use the fact that we, have a, that we don't have a free will as an excuse to just do whatever you want, because, like, well, I, I, I might as well have got about a minute and 40 seconds. It's because, like, we're hedonic creatures, not just us, but other people. So, like, if what we're doing goes against the happiness or the chance of happiness of others, then not because they have a free will, but because of this hedonic imperative that we're always seeking pleasure and, and avoiding pain, then others will respond to us. Now, naturally, if they understand that we don't have a free will, they may um, have to address what we're doing or saying, whatever, in some way, if it's, you know, impinging on their happiness or future happiness, but they can do it without blame, and, and we can do that with others. Okay, um, got one more minute. All right, 11 o'clock, every Wednesday night, Manhattan Neighborhood Network Channel 56, okay? Um, we do a show there. Um, the messenger who is producing the show, he wants to remain anonymous, and I, I, I take the name The Truth Machine on the show. It's a live call-in show in Manhattan. It's excellent. We've been doing this for two quarters already. We've got about, who knows, about 18 uh, weeks going or so. And so, yeah, 11 o'clock Eastern Standard. If, you're, if you don't live in Manhattan, the um, Manhattan Neighborhood Network just um, streams the show live through the Internet. So just go to their site, you know, check it out, and call in. All right. Well, that's that's all we have time for today. Um, yeah, we're gonna be we're gonna continue to um, to explore why free will is impossible, and just as importantly, how we can just create a better, much better world for ourselves and others through this understanding. Okay. Thanks for watching.